For a number of years, the support group has attempted to uh, recruit Dr. Tom Brannigan, who's the amyloid neurologist at Columbia University, and we're very pleased that this time we were successful, and he's going to be talking about symptoms that are associated with peripheral neuropathy. Dr. Brand. So, um, good morning. Um, thank you, Professor Gertz, and thank you for Mariel for inviting me. I've done many of her local and online ones, but it's nice to, nice to come here. And thank you all of, all of you for attending. So I'm going to uh, be uh, speaking uh, primarily about uh, symptoms of uh, peripheral neuropathy and some uh, strategies for trying to help uh, with them. So uh, there are, uh, peripheral neuropathy is a very common disorder. It affects 20 million people in the United States, and there's many different causes of peripheral neuropathy. Amyloidosis is just one of uh, many causes of peripheral neuropathy. Uh, one way that I think is helpful to think about the experience of it and how to address the symptoms are, there's basically three different types of nerve fibers. So there's motor fibers that if they are affected, you can lose your strength and you, the muscles can atrophy. There are sensory fibers, and we often uh, think about both negative sensory symptoms and positive sensory symptoms. So negative sensory symptoms are from the loss of function of the sensory nerve, so you can have loss of ability to feel touch or recognize cold and hot water or recognize pain uh, or uh, recognize loss of uh, what we call proprioception or uh, position sense, so if that becomes impaired, you can lose balance. Sometimes people lose uh, balance in the shower when they close their eyes. Um, and then there are uh, positive sensory symptoms. So when the nerves are damaged, they sometimes become hyperactive and cause pain or unusual sen sensations or discomfort. And uh, so those are you know, often addressed in different ways. Uh, if you have a sensory disorder that's you're losing function, you of course want to treat the underlying disorder that hopefully there can be nerve regeneration. If there's positive symptoms, it's not really from losing more nerve fibers or even progression, but we use medicines to try to stabilize the hyperactivity of nerves. And then uh, there's uh, autonomic nerve fibers. Most neuropathies affect all of these uh, nerve fibers to some degree, even though for most people, say with a diabetic neuropathy or an idiopathic neuropathy, autonomic dysfunction is unusual to be severe, but for some reason that I don't think is well explained, amyloid neuropathy often preferentially and very early affects uh, the autonomic fibers, and the autonomic fibers are the nerves that uh, control the internal organs, so the heart and the nerves and uh, the blood pressure and the GI and sexual and uh, urinary symptoms. So um, when we, as a neurologist, who's, if there's somebody who has numbness and weakness and trouble with walking, we usually try to separate, figure out if uh, the brain or the spinal cord is involved or if the peripheral nerves are involved. And so I'll be talking about peripheral neuropathy. So peripheral neuropathy refers specifically to the nerves in the arms and legs. And uh, usually most neuropathies, including amyloid, the longest nerves are the ones that are affected first. So most people, if they develop numbness or pain uh, or weakness, it's usually at the lengths of the nerves farthest away from the body. So usually the, the toes are affected first. As it progresses, it can go up the leg. And then sometimes the longest nerves in the hands become affected too. Uh, so the, the fingertips could be, become numb. So we sometimes refer to this as a length-dependent uh, problem because the nerves at the longest lengths take the most uh, work of the body to maintain the health of the nerves. And uh, sometimes we refer to this as a stocking and glove uh, pattern where the most prominent symptoms are. So there are, uh, you know, I mentioned peripheral neuropathy is very common and there are people who have very mild neuropathy which is present but not uh, not disabling or distressing. Sometimes people have some numbness in their toes that they can put in the back of their mind. But there are many disabling symptoms of uh, peripheral neuropathy. And I mentioned 
uh, four of them here. So there can be a weakness that can affect your life. There can be severe pain, which can be hard to control or can be controlled, uh, but is disabling. And then uh, as uh, loss of uh, sensory fibers occurs, there can be impaired balance and falls. And also autonomic dysfunction can be disabling. So um, some people, some people, and actually I think many doctors use the word neuropathy as a, a synonym of numbness. So, uh, and I think it's useful to think about uh, what uh, polyneuropathy is, which is the disease that Dr. Uh, Karam mentioned there are approved uh, treatments for. So there are other reasons that you could have numbness other than neuropathy, and uh, two of the other ones which are related often to amyloid, but are not what has been shown, uh, what Vutriceran or Patisseran or Inatursin have been shown to help, are mononeuropathies. The most uh, common one of these is carpal tunnel, and that actually can uh, result from amyloid, but it's not from amyloid invading the nerve, it's from amyloid involving the connective tissues pressing on the nerve. And then the other uh, problem that again can cause numbness but is not neuropathy is uh, spine disease, particularly lumbar spine disease. So sometimes there can be, people can have radiculopathy, pressing of the nerve roots or lumbar stenosis. That, that happens in people without amyloid, but it also can happen in, in people with, neurop with amyloid where there is amyloid again within the spine pressing on the nerves. So again, that's different than a polyneuropathy. So um, when somebody has numbness or weakness or lightheadedness when they stand up or any of these symptoms that makes us think a peripheral neuropathy is a possibility, we, we you know, usually go over the, uh, the uh, symptoms. Uh, and then we uh, often do diagnostic testing to try to clarify what the diagnosis is. So an EMG and nerve conduction study, I, I suspect many people here have had that test as a useful test for, I would say, one, documenting whether somebody has neuropathy, number two, uh, grading the severity of it, but also looking at the differential diagnosis. So an EMG and nerve conduction test can be helpful for seeing if there's a mononeuropathy like carpal tunnel syndrome, seeing if there's a radiculopathy. And then the other issue with EMG and nerve conductions, which I think is important, is the EMG and nerve conductions are a very good test for the large nerve fibers, uh, the motor fibers, and the large sensory fibers that affect balance, but they're not, it's not a test that measures the small sensory fibers that uh, uh, assess uh, pain and temperature. Uh, so you could actually have a, a polyneuropathy that the EMG is normal when just the small fibers are uh, affected. So the other test that we sometimes do is a skin biopsy where we assess the small epidermal nerve fiber test. And the way that's done, it's usually done at the ankle and the thigh because we have normal values uh, of how many nerve fibers there should be there. And uh, typically a neuropathologist will examine the the skin biopsy and count the nerve fibers to see if, if the, it's normal or not. Um, there also are uh, tests of the autonomic nervous system uh, function that's usually assessing the effect of the heart uh, with manipulations, and, the, uh, and there are tests that can affect sweat uh, function. And uh, uh, sometimes, I would say rarely, we do uh, a nerve biopsy, uh, not just a skin biopsy to look at the small nerve fibers, but a full thickness nerve biopsy uh, to, to see what the cause of somebody's neuropathy is, and it actually can sometimes show amyloid. So as far as treatments for polyneuropathy, there is actually no treatment for neuropathy in itself. There's no treatment for nerve damage. Um, there have been many failed uh, trials of nerve growth factors, uh, and there is, I think, some new understanding of different pathways of uh, nerve degeneration and regeneration that many people in the field are optimistic uh, that there will be, at some point in the future, a treatment to help nerves regrow, um, but which is primarily in the laboratory at this time. but. There's no treatment if somebody just has a neuropathy to help regenerate the nerves, but what we can do is we can identify 
the cause of the, the disease causing neuropathy, and if we, can, if we can treat that successfully, then peripheral nerves can regenerate. You know, nerves in the brain and spinal cord generally do not uh, regenerate, but peripheral nerves can regenerate. And then the other thing we can do, uh, other than trying to treat the disease that uh, causes the neuropathy, you know, in this situation, like the, the medications that Dr. Karama just went over, is we simultaneously uh, can treat the symptoms of uh, neuropathy. So we can treat nerve pain, we can treat uh, some of the autonomic symptoms, and then sometimes when people have weakness and balance troubles and falls, physical therapy can be very helpful. So this is from a publication that just came out uh, this year. Dr. Ruberg, who uh, spoke this morning, was the, one of the leaders of this, and Dr. Marr and myself and others were part of this uh, consensus on the multidisciplinary care of people with cardiac amyloid. Uh, and uh, it looks at an approach to somebody with peripheral neuropathy. So on the left is uh, the disease-directed therapy, and that is what Dr. Uh, Karam just went over with you. But on the right-hand side, you can see uh, recommendations for treatment of the symptoms. So uh, there are a number of medications that are used for predominantly pain of uh, sensory neuropathy, so pregabalin, gabapentin, duloxetine, are medicines that uh, have, are affected. Tricyclic antidepressants can be uh, beneficial for nerve pain, uh, though there is a little highlight there that uh, tricyclic antidepressants, because of the concomitant uh, effects of amyloid, they can, they can often cause uh, urinary retention and, uh, and uh, orthostatic hypotension, so they're, they're, they're not always the best medications for people with uh, amyloid neuropathy pain. So pregabalin and deluxetine are the trade names for that, or Lyrica and Cymbalta, are FDA approved for diabetic neuropathy, but we don't really think they work on the diabetes. We think they, they work on the nerve uh, damage and hyperexcitability, so we, we often use those for many types of neuropathy, including people with amyloid neuropathy pain. And then on the, the very fi final column, there's a, a mention of autonomic dysfunction, and this, I think, co uh, kind of overlaps with uh, what Dr. Marr talked about this morning. Uh, when uh, patients have amyloid neuropathy, they can have orthostatic hypotension, so the, the nerves to the blood vessels, particularly in the legs, don't contract when somebody stands up, so you might not be uh, uh, producing enough uh, gener uh, uh, pumping enough blood to the brain so you can pass out or feel lightheaded like you will uh, pass out. But uh, so the usual treatments for that if somebody does not have amyloid or does not have heart failure is to increase your uh, blood volume, drink water, take salt. Uh, and then there's a number of blood pre medications that can increase the blood pressure. They're listed uh, here, so uh, salt tablets, fl uh, fludrocortisone, metadrine, and uh, droxydopa. But, but uh, those could be the exact opposite of what you'd want to do for heart failure. So it's something that needs to be balanced. But the very last medicine that's mentioned here, periodostigmine, uh, has been shown in a uh, placebo-controlled study that was done by uh, Philip Lowe, uh, autonomic expert at the Mayo Clinic, uh, peridostigmine can actually help orthostatic hypotension without uh, worsening heart failure or without raising blood pressure when people lie, lie down at night. So it's often a, an effective medication. There are, it's actually a medicine that's used for an entirely different disease called uh, myasthenia gravis, so most neurologists are familiar with uh, using it. Um, and it's generally a pretty safe and tolerable medicine, though it sometimes can cause diarrhea, which uh, could be a problem if people have diarrhea. But I would say most people who take it do not have uh, diarrhea, so it, it can be uh, helpful. So uh, as far as uh, treatment of uh, neuropathy pain, I, I often divide the medication options we have into these categories. I, I don't, I guess that there could be a fourth category, which could be opiates, which um, there's really not good data of the long-term benefit of opiates and nerve pain, but, um, and, the, and there are some problems that sometimes happen with opiates. So there's uh, different targets uh, for uh, treating nerve pain. One is uh, alpha-2 delta calcium channels, which is a 
channel when nerves are damaged upregulates. It's predominantly in the dorsal horn or the spinal cord that it upregulates. And there's two medications, pregabalin or Lyrica and gabapentin or Neurontin that target that uh, site. And then uh, there's a number of medications. Uh, Cymbalta is one of them. Uh, Amitriptyline is another that affect uh, kind of central uh, brain uh, descending inhibition of the excitability of nerves. So uh, Cymbalta is the medication that's uh, FDA approved, but many of the other medicines in that category have been shown to be helpful for neuropathy pain. And then the third kind of target is sodium channels, which when nerves are damaged, sodium channels which are involved in the excitability of, uh, of uh, nerves upregulate, and there are a number of medications that have been shown to help uh, stabilize that excitability and help uh, nerve pain. So. Uh, those are medications we sometimes use, lamotrigine, oxcarbazepine, uh, lacosamide, mixilatine, and then there's a topical medication called lidocaine, which can be sometimes put directly on the skin, which can be helpful. So the way I think of this is sometimes a single one of these medicines will be helpful and, and people are fine, but sometimes the nerve pain is more complicated and severe, so we sometimes combine drugs, and I often try to pull medicines hitting different targets together, you know, in the same way that if somebody had high blood pressure and just the diuretic wasn't working, then you might use a calcium channel blocker, an ACE inhibitor, or combine uh, different targets. So this is um, you know, some thoughts about non-medicinal treatments for neuropathy. So. Um, Often when somebody has a neuropathy, the nerves to the sweat glands are affected, so the, the foot can become dry and cracked and sometimes even infected. So uh, we often recommend daily foot inspections to make sure you didn't step on something that cut the foot that you might not have recognized because of the loss of sensation. Uh, wearing socks and well-fitting shoes is important, and moisturizing lotion, particularly if you have dry feet, is important to help the help prevent the uh, cracks and uh, problems that can occur in the feet. Uh, if people have hand weakness or difficulty using their hands, occupational therapy can be helpful. Uh, people with weakness and uh, trouble with walking, physical therapy and, uh, can be helpful. People with uh, neuropathy benefit from physical therapy, but also people with lumbar stenosis often benefit from core strengthening within physical therapy before I would say that's a pre-surgical uh, approach, or working on core strengthening for lumbar stenosis. If somebody has a, a foot drop that persists, uh, there is uh, braces or orthosis, ankle foot orthosis, that can be helpful from not having you trip over your foot because it's not uh, coming up. Uh, carpal, tunnels, if, carpal tunnel is very common in people with amyloid, as well as very common in the population in general. So if somebody has a mild carpal tunnel, we often initially prescribe a wrist brace, uh, which can help. Uh, we, I usually recommend that people give it at least a month before they give up on the benefit and try to wear it every day or at least every night. But uh, if the carpal tunnel uh, advances and is affecting motor function, I would say most people would recommend that it be sur you know, surgically approached. Um, and then uh, orthostatic hypotension we've al already talked about, but as far as non-medicinal Treatments. It's important when you sleep uh, to elevate the bed, elevate the head of the bed about 30 degrees because there's a, this natural uh, diuresis where you, you, know, you urinate at night and uh, release fluid. So that's actually a helpful measure to elevate the head 30 degrees. Uh, and then uh, if you, when you get out of bed early in the morning, do, you know, make uh, positional changes slowly. Uh, compression stockings uh, can sometimes be helpful. Some people find that very helpful. Other people find it uncomfortable. And then there are also abdominal binders that can be helpful. So this uh, is just a, a summary. Um, I think our first uh, step when somebody has symptoms of polyneuropathy is to, with the symptoms and the physical exam and the confirmatory tests, we try to confirm uh, the diagnosis, and then we evaluate for uh, causes, and then we also encourage you to avoid um, exacerbating causes. I, I would say one thing that I see pretty often that I often mention uh, is vitamin B6, if it's slow, can cause a neuropathy, but 
The more common situation is people take mega doses of vitamin B6, and what that dose is is a little unclear, but it's very clear if you take more than 100 milligrams of B6, and I've seen people take 200 or 1,000 milligrams thinking it's gonna help their carpal tunnel or thinking it's gonna help their neuropathy, and that can actually damage the nerves. So you want to uh, be careful with supplements, particularly supplements containing uh, B6. And then we treat the underlying cause in the, in the situation of amyloid. Of course, we have uh, medications for the hereditary form of the disease, and then we also uh, treat symptoms, treat uh, pain and discomfort. Uh, physical therapy uh, can be helpful for gait troubles. And then uh, with auto autonomic symptoms, we can uh, often treat the orthostatic hypotension, work with our colleagues in GI and urology, and uh, treat sexual dysfunction. So uh, thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to answer questions in the later sessions.